studying about uh, our freedom in Christ. So we will, uh, in honor of our Mother's Day today, we will, uh, you know, change the subject just for today and we'll continue the series next week. You know, today for our meditation, just to encourage you and for our prayer, we'll look at Old Testament passage from uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 1 through 7. 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 1 through 7. Let's read God's word together as we usually do. If you find the portion in your Bible, you can look there or you can look at the screen. And I will read from uh, the New International Version. 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 1 through 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars and as each is full, put it to one side. She left him and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your son can live on what is left. There are five different miracles that is recorded in this chapter of Second Kings. We see that you, know, you cannot read the Bible without believing in miracles. God does things in his own ways, in his own times, you know, to accomplish his own plan. So that is many times the miracles that happens. Here we see Elisha is the successor of Elijah. Elijah was a fiery prophet and his ministry was more or less in public. And we see that confronting the false prophets and correcting the nation, bringing them back to the Lord and his ways. But Elisha was more private and many of his miracles, there are 14 of the miracles that is recorded in the, the scripture. He is more or less, it is more about private things. It is about provision over here, the providing healing to the dead son of the another woman that we read in the next, next uh, uh, paragraph. And uh, giving protection to the people and trying to find out what is happening or God reveal to him what is happening in the enemy's territory. Those are the things that we see with uh, Elisha's miracle. Here we see there is a mother who is so desperate as we learned yesterday also. You know, coming to the end of her rope. I think that we all will come metaphorically that, that phrase, we come to the end of the rope. There is no other way out. What else we do at that place? You know, there are different responses to that question. How do we respond or what we do at the end of our rope? You know, the, the pessimists say that there is no way you give up and let it go. It is over. The optimists say that no, you tie a knot and just try to climb up. This could have been worse, but at least you have many things to go up. A realist may say that you climb, you know, there is still you can make it. But what this lady is doing in the midst of crisis, you know, I was reading in the, in the, in the Chinese language, in the world crisis, the same characters you use used for danger and opportunity. So as a believer, maybe every crisis, every dangerous situation is an opportunity for God to manifest. Or this person that we see that she came to the end of her last drop, came to the end of herself, we can say. And when we come to the end of ourselves, I believe that as the scripture teaches many occasions, that is where God began to work. When we come to the end of ourselves, and that is where we know that there is nowhere else to go, 
There is nowhere else to look. That is where we look up. In the some days God wants us to be there. Because as long as we know what to do, how to do, there is no need of God in that situation. But there are places and times that we come, we will not be able to do anything. That is where God starts to work into lives. So let us look into this video as the story we already read. There is no need of narrating it anymore. But what the good thing she did or what we all can do or we should do is that in the midst of our crisis, in the end of our situations, the only thing that we can do or we should do is to go back to God. And you know, return to God, seek his face. Here we read that what she did. You know, there was death in her, in, in, in her home. It says that the wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha. You know, we see that there was like a seminary student or a, you know, the, the prophet under training. The people there, they have no other means. They have nothing to, to take care of their own needs. And we don't know who this person is. In a majority of the commentators and the tradition says that this may be the man, the Obadiah. Remember that in the first Kings chapter 18, that we read about a man who was working in uh, the Ahab, the wicked king's palace. He might have been this person. That's what many of the people try to say. We don't know who he is. If he is that person, what he was doing, he was trying to sustain you know, many prophets from uh, Ahab or keeping away from the trouble. That's what he was doing. But when he came and he had problem, he just died. She lost uh, her hope and the protection, the provision and everything that she is looking for, the security that she has, you know, he has already gone. So, so people die, right? People die. Death is a difficult situation also. Metaphorically speaking, you know, there are dead situations also in life. We look like there is no hope at all. She is in such a place. And not only that, she is, the, the, the husband is dead and she has a lot of debt also. You know, we have to pause and say one thing over there. We cannot judge a person by his or her position or her possession or his, his or her possession. We cannot judge a person by their position in life or by their possessions. You know, there is two extremes in Christian faith that we see. One is that we call the prosperity gospel or the prosperity theology. Now, people believe that if you are poor, it is because you are cursed. You know, if you don't have enough, it is because of you are under the curse. If you follow Christ, follow God, God should bless you. And if you have any blessing that you experience, if there is a lack, it is because of something wrong. And you just claim it and you will get it. So people just try to talk about that. You know, people are fascinated by that. There are people called the faith movement people. You know, and uh, there are this, uh, we call this uh, prosperity people, called the notoriously known as prosperity gospel. You know, people preach us that. People go after all these things. I want to get it. I want to get it. That is one side of the thing. And in response to that, there is other people we call the poverty gospel. They say that if you are rich, that means there is something wrong. So you did something wrong. That's why you made what you do. Being poor is better. That is what we know we are in God's grace. Both are wrong. Because you know, if some people are poor, it, it is not their fault. If this is a man who was living under difficult circumstances, because Ahab was a king at that time, that the, the prior to this, that we see that he was killing all the True prophets, they were hiding. They couldn't leave. They couldn't survive at all. So it was not their intention to make money either. If Obadiah was this character as we are talking about here, he was supporting 700 other prophets also. So it is not their fault. The people are in poverty. And so some people, you know, so blessings is not merely material things only. So somebody is rich doesn't mean that there is something wrong. Somebody poor doesn't mean that there is something wrong either. Both these we have to understand, right? So we have to come to that balance there actually. If God wants us to be like that, it is God's desire for us. So it is not we want to make things that is, is not out of God's will in life at all. So we have to be careful when we look into that. You know, this man, you know, and of course, as, as husbands, as fathers, as parents, it is our responsibility to support and provide for our children and to leave the things for them. That is all good things. But if, what if there is nothing much? What else you can do about it? You know, you can do much about it either. So it is not about the money. Some people are rich here, but we read about a person in the Bible that Jesus talked about that he was a rich, but he was a fool. Because he was richness only for this world. There was nothing that he kept for the world to come. There are people 
that we see that they have nothing but they have our eternal inheritance and they rejoice in that that is the balance that we see in the scripture so it doesn't it is it is not bad to be rich or even poor in that matter that is where we have to look into that so this person this wife or this widow this mother is in deep trouble there is death in family that result in lot of debt also there then what happen that she is now facing the creditors are coming to take her sons away from her to make them slaves so there we read that she was mourning she was crying to to this prophet the word that used over there is that she was weeping uncontrollably that means there is so much of grief that she is not able to explain to 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 any anyone else that is where she is but she come to the prophet and tells him what look at that what he says your servant my husband is dead and you know that he revered or feared the lord i think that that is the greatest testimony that any one of us can get it is not about the testimony that come from our people in that sense the people those who live with you they attest and say that yes my husband fear god my wife fear god do you know that i think that that is the greatest testimony that we should carry this is not about us we stand here or when we put a in a face upon our people the testimony should come from where from our families from our home you know we should those who live within close proximity they should be able to attest and say that my husband he fear god my wife who prays and she fear god that is the testimony that is the testimony as parents we have to carry then only our children will also follow the same god that is very very crucial and we all have to agree and understand that right this is very important so that is even if did he have any money but she came back and say that my husband your friend who feared the lord that i know that I take it as a challenge today you know take it as a challenge it's not only when you come to church it is when you stand before other people you know in the privacy of our home we should be who we are we should be the children of god we should be spiritual in our private life then only god will honor in our public so because god sees all these things and she came to elisha elisha is the visual representative of god at that time as a prophet as he stand as god's representative she came to the prophet as we said in the beginning this is what we do we don't have to go to a person now but where we go we can directly come to god's presence the psalm that we read in this morning is psalm 46 verse 1 it says that god is a very present help at the time of our trouble god is a very present help in hebrew chapter 4 that we read we can boldly come to the throne of his grace you know we can come so we don't need a middleman here you don't need nels in that matter we can come boldly to god's presence with our needs and with our trials and difficulties in our lives so he see she came all of us will come in our life to the end of the rope or we all will come these kind of situations in life also you know as the children used to say life is not fair at all times there are difficulties there are challenges there are problems that we face the bible attests that truth in job chapter 14 verse 1 job says that man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble man he that is born of a woman is of few days and full of troubles we live only here few days few years maybe but that is filled with the trouble jesus echo the same sentiment in john chapter 16 verse 33 he says that i have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world you will have trouble but there is a good news that he says but take heart don't lose heart i have overcome the world you know this is the reality of life may not things may not go as smooth as we intend or things always we have troubles this is what the bible attests it so when we have troubles doesn't mean that we are out of god's will or we have something really bad happens sometimes that troubles are shaping us that should bring us to god himself 
so when we are in trouble the devil the, the world the flesh and everything will unanimously tell us that there is no hope god doesn't even care for us that may be the thing but the bible teaches that not that is not the truth god's eyes are upon you at all times if uh, proverbs chapter 15 verse 3 the bible declares this the eyes of the lord are everywhere keeping watch on the wicked and the good the eyes of the lord are everywhere keeping watch on the wicked and the good there is another famous scripture that we caught many occasions in second chronicles chapter 16 verse 9 the bible says that for the eyes of the lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him this is what god is doing this morning god sees each one of us god sees our struggles god sees our trials god sees our our heart aches god sees everything that we go through in our life and sometimes we will be able to express this to other people because they will never understand people will always have a conclusion of our all problems but god knows exactly what and how are we go through and how we feel in our lives also so she came to this man of god and with her problems before her he asked her a question look at that question verse 2 elisha replied to her how can i help you tell me what do you have in your house two questions what do you need what do you have either either the size of her problem the smallness of her resource both are the things that we see over there now he she came and he asked this question what do you have what do you have there is nothing that uh, she can do at this position that is where she came to this man if he can handle our own problems there is no need of god to intervene in that situation right so that is where god start to work he asked this question you know what can i do for you what is what is a question is that god sometimes ask questions to us it is not because god in know the situation over the circumstances it is to remind us sometimes where we are at this point sometimes to reveal our voices that you know our resources cannot help us in any way at all somebody said like this sometimes our competency is a hindrance to god's work in our life our competency is a hindrance to do god's work into our life we see this several examples in the scripture for that in joshua chapter 7 there we read that the people of israel those coming after a great victory in jericho now they walked around the jericho and jericho fell down we know the story in in joshua chapter 6 and then they are going to the next town now this ai was a small village type place in comparison to 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 jericho so they are coming there then they gather and say that there's only of all of us to go, to go only a couple of thousand people just go and uh, defeat it that's what they did so we can just go it is like a piece of cake it is eat and do it and they went and they tried to do it the result was they miserably failed they lost the war the battle over there and what happened then we read in chapter 8 god restored them gave them victory sometimes our confidence is the problem and we think that we can handle it we always hear this phrase actually i am a self made man right you know there will be dangerous actually people like that right they are self made even god they think by themselves so sometimes our our confidence in our selves i can do it i can handle it sometimes god wait for the resources to come down and we start to look up to him there is another in a familiar passage to all of us one of the favorite prayers that i liked in the bible for years i read this again and again second chronicles chapter 20 verse 12 we know the prayer of jehoshaphat remember that that prayer jehoshaphat prays oh our god will you not judge them for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us the next phrase is very beautiful you look at that things i think that you all might have underlined i will because we said this so many times we do not know what to do but our eyes are always upon you we do not know what to do but our eyes are upon you this is the principle that we learn here great things happen 
when we realize our inability. Great things happen in our lives when we realize our powerlessness. We are not able to do it. I think that this is this is the prayer that we started when we started three years ago. This was one of the prayers that we are quoting. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. The Christian journey, spiritual growth, is a constant struggle. Who is in charge? It is a is a struggle. It is a it is a process continually breaking our false security in ourselves. Salvation itself is that. The question is that who is in charge? You know, when self is in charge, when we take care of ourselves and the devil is in charge of our life, that is where we live in sin. But God take control of our life. Jesus become Lord of our life. That is what salvation is, right? So salvation itself is that. What is that? It is trusting Jesus and giving up our life to him. The mistake some days that we make is this. The mistake is this. For salvation we trust God. Because we know that at least that we cannot do anything about that at all. <laughs> but when you come to the rest of the things what happen? We think that we can handle it by ourselves. But that's not true. Every day this is a struggle. We ask who is in charge? Who is in charge? Of our prayed this prayer in the midst of, of, of a great struggle before a vast army. And he calculated all the things. And he forces are not enough. It is not enough to win this war. There he prayed this prayer. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. My my dear brothers and sisters, to be. That is where God wants us to be, maybe. So what do you do? Let us trust the Lord. Let us pray for him. The second thing he is asking is, what do you have? What do you have? In the Bible, God created everything out of nothing. God created everything out of nothing. He didn't have anybody's help for that. He didn't ask anybody, would you please come and help me to do these things. No. God ever did by himself. Without anybody's help. Out of nothing. That is what the scripture teaches. God created everything out of nothing. He, God created everything out of nothing. Do he, do he need our help? Or do he, he need any of these resources? Do you need it? No. But it's God in his infinite wisdom. Sometimes that's where God works. That we said this many times. God gave an opportunity to partner with him. In John chapter 2. You know we read that story. And I think especially in John. That we see this again and again. In, in, the, in the wedding at Cana. Jesus asked the people. Fill the jar with the water. If God can change water into wine. Do you think that he can and say that let there be wine. He is asking the people to obey. And trust in him. Demonstrate their trust in him. Through simple obedience. So sometimes we are looking for a big things to obey. But God is asking us to do. Small obedience. Little things. Be obedient in our little things. God is calling for to do that. In John chapter 11 we read. About Lazarus was raised by Jesus. There also that Jesus says that. Remove the, the stone from the tomb. If God can raise Lazarus from the dead. Out of just a call. Do you think that uh, without, without that, uh, that stone. He can do it? Yes he can do it. But what is he doing? He is giving an opportunity again. To demonstrate the simple faith and trust in him. Here we ask is this actually. When we fail to realize that. God has already provided many of our needs. If you are a child, we have what we have. Look at the resources. The promises of God. We have the promise. Promised us, call unto me, I will answer. I will give you great and mighty things. You know, God will reveal great and mighty things. He will answer our prayers. In Matthew chapter 7, that we that ask, seek and knock. 
if even though you are evil you want to give good gifts to your children how much more the help you is is the, the good things as you ask him god is asking so god has promised us not only that god has promised us his promises that we have we have his we have the ability of his power in us so we have to understand that you know we are not panic when things go wrong why because we know that god is with us god's presence is with us look at this woman what she what a crazy suggestion that uh, the elisha is giving to her she said elisha said to go, said to her go around and ask all you jars don't ask for just few then go inside sons what she did she went and did only her to do he can just imagine this imagine this scenario here you know her husband is died she and she came back and coming back and uh, you know going around the neighbor's home and asking this can i have a pot can i have a pan can i have a bottle she is going around asking for this this thing he can just imagine they are curious right if the indian neighbors they already know everything how much oil left there how much money they know it actually so why is she is going and asking this question you know she pond their questions or this crazy many a places the miracles won't happen because we are more concerned about our reputation than the sense of god now we are very careful actually when we pray also look, look at the how do we does not god will hear we times the question we ask is this actually god is asking sometimes are you willing to become a fool for me will you declare that you know are you ready to do it will you repeat what i say that is what she, this lady was doing actually she is going after how sartre asking this question or the sons are going and asking this question again and again what happened then because of this because now she set up herself in a scenario and she went and asked him would you wrestle i don't know what is going to happen the things went well that became a testimony because of that so stand in faith in the promises of god step out of our comfort zone declare those things when things happen that will bring glory to god that will be a testimony so that's what we have to do and remember that i think that in ezekiel chapter 37 that god asked a question to ezekiel will this bones be alive what was ezekiel's answer to that let me google it and see right no what that's what he had said he said god you know it speak to the bones and he did it exactly that is where he declared god's word it's not this our wishful thinking we repeat it rather we repeat what god says she was willing to obey the question we ask today is that are we willing to obey she went and what happened there then start to increase and expand within her she obeyed what the prophet asked her to do so it was not a public thing there was no spectacular thing in it was happened there it within the privacy of their home itself they closed the door they shut inside and they start to do what exactly the prophet start to do sometimes we are in shut in situations again the end of the rope places we don't know how to do and how to move forward but that is where god teaches tremendous lessons you know when paul was got saved as we look into the other day the question he asked in acts chapter 9 verse 5 was who are you it was his question but in ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 he talk about the same god he says that who he is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or even imagine years of his life 
where he come from who are you lord to the god who is able how that happen do you think that it was a from a seminary lesson he said from his greek class if it is places no he you read the second corinthian at least there we read that paul went through in a struggle some trials and difficulties in his life and he experienced god in personal way he learned it well now he is encouraging other people says that you know about our god i ask this question who is this god but i will tell you who this god is who he is able who is able to do he is able to do exceedingly he is able to do exceedingly abundantly paul learned this intellectually not from the books not from paul learned this through the spirit life so when god asks us to do things when we come to the end of our life i pray that this is the lesson that we learn also the work of god in our lives as lena god come at the fourth watch of our life sometimes you know we want god and then we will start our journey but god says that you go i will do it you know there is no where else in scripture god in give a road map to anybody that god asked to follow him not to abraham not to noah not to moses not anyone of us you take the first step and the rest will be follow god will show the next step then that is the way you learn dependency upon him we nowadays uh, we have the convenience of gps and maps and google so all kinds of things we know where we are going what is the traffic in between how many cars is on the road all the details we know then only we leave home still we are late unfortunately right <laughs> that is what we want to do but that's what the christian journey happens we walk with uh, god one step at a time one step at a time that is where we learn to trust in him what happened here the great result that we see god at he already promised she start to pour oil in it was filled she start to pour oil that jar was filled jar after jar jar after jar it is filling and filling and filling what is the principle here god will do what he already promised there is one thing the bible says that god cannot do god cannot lie because he is not a man whatever god says it will happen it's a beautiful scripture that we read in joshua chapter 21 verse 43 through 45 joshua chapter 21 verse 43 through 45 so the lord this is the after they conquer the land and they came to the the promised land they are settling down there and this is the end of joshua's life this is what we read so the lord gave israel all the land he had sown to give their ancestors and they took possession of it and settled there verse 44 the lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sown to their ancestors not one of their enemies withstood them the lord gave all their enemies into their hands next verse verse 45 not one of all lord's good promises to israel failed every one was fulfilled Do you read that? None of the God's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. When? That is the question. When was it? God gave this promise when? God gave this promise in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham. Is Abraham is here? No. Isaac is here? No. Jacob is there? No. Or to all? God you know, renewed the covenant again and again. Told them... again and again even moses is here no now we come to the end of joshua no it is it was an easy journey is this in joshua itself that we read 30 plus kings joshua defeated there was fight after fight there was battle after battle there was war after war so it was an easy journey there was lacks there was difficulties there was murmuring millions of people died on the process on the way all these things happened all these things happened but here we read at the end of the day you know who led these people out of the bondage of egypt is no more at all but here we read in the scripture spirit recorded it says that none of the good promises of god never failed all of them were fulfilled in, in, in what does that tells us then remember that 
Moses died, Abraham died, Isaac died, Joseph, all these people died. But God remained the same. He fulfilled his promises. God will do what he told us to do. No matter what. But there are struggles, there are difficulties, there are challenges, there are wars, there are battles, there are enemies, there is a lot of things in between. But God is faithful. So that is a principle that we see very simple, but that is a profound thing we can learn into our life also. This morning, as we sit in God's presence, I just, I just want to encourage you. I think that this weekend, this is a theme that we want to echo again and again. God is faithful and he will do it. He will come for us on the fourth watch. You know, we experience, we hear this great story is how God came through his life. This morning, we have to be encouraged. If you are discouraged, if you think that you are end of your hope, you think that there is no hope at all, and you think that there is no other way, trust the Lord and obey what he says. Simple thing. May not be a bigger thing God asks you to do. Give away something. Just obey the Lord. The oil flowed until the vessel was run out. Remember this. God's no limits whatsoever at all. God need, you know, there is you know, again exceedingly more than we ask or even imagine. God is able to do that. So what we do here limit God. We don't want to put God in a in a in a box. What is the lesson we can learn here from this simple story? This is the little things. If God wants to do greater things in our life, we should be obedient to small things. That is what this lady is doing. She has to use what she had. So, to see big little things of God. So we trust the Lord. That Just give back to Him and obey. But that is what God inviting us to do. And we want to admit our emptiness into acknowledge the only one who can fill life with so many things. That because of that. But we come and we accept and understand that Lord, I need you. You know, when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, some of the people argue always actually, there is no need of waiting. The Holy Spirit is already here. Yes, that is the truth. The Holy Spirit is already here. The Holy Spirit is willing to fill us at all times. Then why we wait then? The waiting for the Holy Spirit, we are waiting to empty ourselves actually. Because we are full of ourselves. We are so many things in us. We are full of so many other stuff. So we want to take those things out. Sometimes it may take time. Wait upon that, all the emptiness to, all the stuff in us to go. And we acknowledge that, Lord, we are empty. We need you. Fill us with your, with your presence. So this Elijah told that, Elijah, emptier. Get more. As much as you. You know, if you are willing to receive, God is here to place. Anytime you go to God's presence, God is always ready. God is always ready. He is willing to give. He is a giver. He is willing to give that and do it again and again. But the question is, are we ready for that? You know, are we empty for that? Are we wait upon that? That is the question. She just collected all the emptiness in one way we can say. She brought all these things. She had a bigger emptiness as much as she needed. Would you please pray this morning, Lord, I come. And I want to empty myself. You know, we come week after we have a leak problem. You know? So we empty, we fill and go and become empty again. We have to find out where that leak is. <laughs> we have to find it out. We have to fill it. We have to overflow with the God's presence. Oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit in the scripture also, right? So we pray the Lord, 
fill me. Those who listen to me. Remember that we cannot do all these tasks by our, our own ability. As he said, I told you that, you know, somebody told that there are 125,000 books were written about parenting. You know, then that, that man said that if you put in perspective, put those, those books above, you can see that that will be the, the tallest building will be lesser than that. 125,000 books. How many of you book your husbands and wife actually to raise children? You will be totally confused today. <laughs> there is only six verses in the Bible for parenting principles. Only six verses. But where we get this wisdom and guidance as we need it, as we are living in this wicked world. We need God's for that. We need God's grace for that. So pray that our children will be filled with the Holy Spirit. All mothers, you pray before they become doctors or engineers or collectors or lawyers or pastors. You know, the Indians like the R job, right? R word, letter, R, R letter word. You know, engineer, collector, doctor, pastor, you know. So, before that, pray the Lord, fill them with the Holy Spirit. Pray that prayer. This was a prayer that church prayed years. Sometimes we forget to pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit. This mother, look at that, what she is teaching here. She is teaching her children also dependent on God. In our partakers, partners in this miracle. I think that, you know, she didn't say that you stay there, let me go close the door and pray. No. She demonstrated her God that is that Father. You demonstrate. You don't tell them what to do. You show them what to do. Because children are the best observers and the worst interpreters. They observe the things and they interpret in a very bad way. So they won't listen, they won't hear what you say. You get angry because you say this again and again. They are not doing it. But you know what it is? You show them. You lie down on the bed and ask them to get up. That will never work at all. You get up and say that, let us get up. That's the way it is. So remember that. So the mother's job over here is, he is one way transferring her faith into the children, teaching them how to trust the Lord. That is our job. That is our job, especially here. Then the lesson we can learn over here is that exercise our faith. It is easy to say or talk about faith, but are you willing to exercise it? Again, we don't have to go. You all know the story, example after example, the scripture teaches that. When Noah asked to build it with a build a boat, an ark, he had never seen rain before. You know how long he is? 100 plus years he talked about it. At least his family believed him. No one else. That is a great thing actually. The, make your family believe what you are do the crazy things actually. That is what he did. He didn't have no clue what should happen. But he was exercising faith every single day. Look at how many years? 120. That's what it says. You know, we can easily say that 100 plus years. Not one day. Not two weeks. Not one year. Hundred long years, he was exercising his faith in the Lord. Get discouraged, you know. You know what needs to be done. Let us exercise our faith. Abraham waited for all them because they trust the Lord. Number four, what is the lesson we can learn? Remember and know that God works in His own way. God works his own way. God didn't give her money all of a sudden. Mysterious ways sometimes. We don't know how God operates. This morning, would you please trust the Lord? Mother is here. Start praying for your children to transfer your faith that you have. Not only just teaching, but show how you teach. Now they look back, they understand. As the older you have to understand how they were sustained in those situations. That is our responsibility. Would you please pray with me this morning as we conclude here. You pray. Lord, I am. Would you please fill me? I want stuff. And trust the Lord. Exercise your faith this morning. And God will do what he has promised. That may not be night. will do that. 
then takes what he has said. He did what he has said. So this morning I just want God will come through on the fourth watch. Now be persistent in our prayers. Do not give up. Trust the Lord. Cling on to him. Cling on to him. And pray to the Lord. Are you desperate? Anything else this morning? Are you living in debt spiritually? Or in any other aspect? If you are bound by Ask what do you have? Bring that before God. God will take care of it and will multiply it. He will use it for your glory, for His glory. This is a reflection of. We will pray together. Lord. I have a hope. And I have a future, I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over, a new beginning's just begun. I have a hope, I have a hope, and God has a plan. It's not to harm me, but it's to prosper me And to hear me when I call, He intercedes for me Working all things for my good, though trials may come But we have this hope I will yet praise Him my great Redeemer, I will yet stand up and give Him glory with my life. He takes my darkness and He turns it into light. I will yet praise Him, my Lord, my God. Let's all stand as we sing this chorus. I will yet praise Him, my great